In fact, I would argue that the failure of theism to explain the fine-tuning of the universe is paradigmatic. It helps understand the other ways in which theism fails to be a better theory than naturalism. Now, before we review those arguments, let me just say a word about Professor Carroll's uh, concluding remarks, which I believe are extraneous to tonight's discussion. Those of you watching this video who have experience in interscholastic or intercollegiate policy debate are already familiar with the expression stock issues, but I bet the rest of you are not. The concept of stock issues originates in argumentation theory used in those competitive debate formats. What I want to do is, is propose a framework of stock issues for formal debates, not between high school and college students necessarily, but between thinkers who engage in formal debates concerning what I call philosophy of religion plus or POR plus. This presentation is too long for a single video, so I will divide it into multiple videos. In this video series, I plan to do three things. First, I will provide a very brief and oversimplified summary of the role of stock issues in formal debates by looking at how stock issues are used in policy debate a quick summary of the individual issues themselves, why stock issues are useful, and then the types of POR plus debate topics, which I think might benefit from a stock issues framework. Second, I will then introduce my proposed theory of stock issues. In order to do this, I will introduce a novel taxonomy of arguments for and against God's existence. Using this taxonomy, I will then review excerpts or, when available, clips from past POR plus debates to illustrate how various arguments used in debates fit into my proposed framework. Not only do I think this taxonomy is intrinsically interesting from a philosophy of religion perspective, but I think building a taxonomy on this framework can improve the quality of debate. Towards that end, I will attempt to illustrate how my proposed stock issues framework could have improved the quality of past debates. Finally, third, I will apply the concept of decision rules to formal POR plus debates. Before I present my theory of stock issues in formal POR plus debates, I first need to provide some background. The concept of stock issues originates in competitive interscholastic or high school and intercollegiate policy debates. In those debate formats, there are three parties, the affirmative team, the negative team, and the debate judge or judges. The debate topic is defined by a resolution. The resolution, in turn, implies duties for each of the parties. The affirmative side proposes a plan to implement the resolution. The affirmative side has the burden of proof. The negative side argues against the affirmative plan. The negative side only has the burden of rejoinder. The judge or judges votes for the debater or debaters, which better defended their side based on the arguments stated during the debate round. Let me quickly illustrate this with an example. The national debate resolution for the 2005 to 2006 academic year was resolved that the United States federal government should substantially decre decrease its authority either to detain without charge or search without probable cause. While doing research for this presentation, I found the blog of the Kansas State debate champion for that academic year. On that blog, the debater had posted their affirmative speech. I've posted the link in case you're interested in reading their entire speech, but what I want to highlight is their plan. I quote, Extend prisoner of war status under the Geneva Convention to all prisoners held at Guantanamo Bay and all combatants captured by the United States forces from now forward. The administration should allow United Nations inspectors full access to the facility, end quote. Imagine you were a high school debater in 2006 trying to support or oppose that plan. 
what kind of what kinds of arguments do you think would be relevant? The concept of stock issues defines the kind of arguments that are relevant. In policy debate, most debaters and debate judges have agreed there are a set of stock issues. Significance or harms, inherency, topicality, and solvency. If you were to go to the link on the previous slide, you would find in the state debate champion's speech section titles for harms, inherency, plan, advantages, and solvency. He did not have a section for topicality, but that's standard because the topicality of the affirmative plan is obvious and doesn't need to be explicitly argued for. What about the negative teams who had to respond to that speech? Negative teams responding to that affirmative plan would be expected to run arguments or objections based upon one or more of the stock issues listed on the slide. The only exception to what I just said would be if the negative team were to argue that there is some other type of issue not included in the five above. If you read, or I should say four above because I've listed four on the slide, if you read the wiki page for stock issues, you can skip down to the other components section of the wiki page to see examples of what these other issues might be. Again, all I am doing at this point in the presentation is providing some context for what I mean when I talk about stock issues. I'm not going to read the slide to you, but I think that if you pause the video and think about each of the stock issues listed, you will probably agree that they are directly relevant to any formal debate in which one side is defending a plan or policy. So with that example in mind, we are now in a position to appreciate the benefits of having defined stock issues. Stock issues clearly define the responsibilities for each role in a debate, the debaters as well as the judge or judges. Furthermore, stock issues clearly define the types of arguments which are relevant in a debate. When a debater, a policy debater, says they are going to defend or challenge, say, the solvency of the affirmative plan, everyone knows exactly what the debater means. Not only is this useful during the debate round, but it is also useful before the debate round when debaters are preparing for the debate. It gives them a sort of checklist of issues they need to be prepared to defend. For all these reasons, then, I think stock issues are useful for formal debating. Unfortunately, however, for formal philosophy of religion debates and related debates, to my knowledge, no one has even attempted to define a paradigm or theory of stock issues. That's what I'm going to try to do here. In order to do this, I first need to define my scope. While people could apply the concepts I'm going to discuss to informal debates, uh, say on Twitter, on call-in shows, podcasts, etc., my intent is solely, solely for formal debates on college campuses or big public venues. The debates might not have debate judges, but they will have a defined format with a set number of time speeches centered around a predefined topic. In terms of the topics to which my theory will apply, I envision them as applying not just to philosophy of religion, but to what I called philosophy of religion plus. So again, by philosophy of religion plus, I mean the philosophy of religion plus related debates in cosmology, biology, metaethics, religious studies, history, and so forth. Specifically, I have in mind the following types of debate topics. Does X exist? Did Y happen? What is the best explanation of Z? Specific examples of debate topics which would be considered in scope would be the following. Does God exist? Did the universe have a beginning or have a cause? Are living things the result of unguided evolution or the result of intelligent design? Is morality objective or subjective? Is God necessary for life to have meaning? Did God raise Jesus from the dead? Is the Torah, the Bible, the Quran, the Book of Mormon, and so forth, 
the Word of God. With all of that background out of the way, I'm now able to present my proposed framework of stock issues. My proposal is for two genus level stock issues, topicality and arguments. But arguments isn't very descriptive, so I've broken arguments down into three types, impossibility, improbability, and pragmatic. My working hypothesis is that all relevant arguments in POR plus debates fit into one of those three types. Depending on the type of argument, different species level stock issues will apply. I'll explain all of these terms in detail throughout the video series. But the idea is that if a person runs, say, an impossibility argument, the species level stock issues would include what I call essentiality and inconsistency. If you run an improbability argument, the species level stock issues would include what I call factuality, prior or intrinsic probability, and likelihood. Finally, if you run a pragmatic argument, the species level stock issues would include alternatives and expected utility. Again, I will explain all of these in detail as we progress through the presentation. Let's turn to my first proposed stock issue, topicality. I'm going to start with an oversimplified definition of topicality. Topicality is concerned with whether a debater's opening statement or arguments are relevant to the debate topic. I think topicality is something pretty much everyone who cares about debates should care about. If you've ever watched or read any kind of a debate where you felt frustrated by one of the debaters who never seemed to talk about the topic, then in, you, in your mind, whether you knew it or not, you were raising the issue of topicality. Unfortunately, the only people who are trained how to think about and argue topicality or related topics in formal debate-like settings are formal debaters uh, or competitive debaters and lawyers. In this section, I will teach you how to think and argue about topicality. In formal competitive high school and collegiate policy debate, topicality is usually defined as an argument debating whether the affirmative's plan follows the resolution. For example, let's turn again to the 2005 to 2006 national debate resolution for high school debate. Resolved that the United States federal government should substantially decrease its authority either to detain without charge or search without probable cause. Now, unlike the plan I quoted earlier, imagine the affirmative team presented a different plan, something that decreases the frequency of detainments or searches without probable cause by some minuscule amount. In response to such a plan, the negative team might run the following topicality argument. The affirmative's plan, if adopted, would not substantially decrease the U.S. federal government's authority. <clears throat> In policy debate, a topi topicality argument has four elements. Number one, definition or interpretation. That element says the definition of the word or the interpretation of the topic you are running topicality on. Number two, violation. This is where you identify the element of the affirmative's plan that proves that they are not addressing the topic. Number three, standards. Why the negative's interpretation of the topic or definition of the word is superior. And number four, voters. Why the judge should vote on topicality. The standards that one can use in policy debate, there's a number of well-defined standards that you will hear policy debaters refer to. One of them is limits. The negative team will argue that there should be a limit on the number of cases that are topical under the resolution. This goes hand in hand with predictability because if the topic isn't limited, then the negative won't possibly be able to research every single thing about the resolution and the affirmative could always pick some obscure thing vaguely related to the resolution for their plan. This is also important for in-round education because without limits, we will never be able to get an in-depth understanding on any one thing because the topic is much too big. 
the standard of ground says um, this is a measure of the quantity uh, or quality of arguments that are available to both teams. In an ideal world, both affirmative and negative teams would have the same amount of good arguments that they can use in every round. The negative team will argue that the affirmative's interpretation takes away specific arguments that the negative should be able to run, uh, arguments in policy debate that are known as disadvantages and counterplans. The predictability standard uh, says uh, if the negative team runs a predictability standard, the negative team is arguing that because the affirmative doesn't meet the negative's interpretation, the affirmative is presenting an unpredictable case. The negative uses the resolution as a starting point for their research. If the affirmative is outside of the resolution, there is a very slim chance that the negative has answers to their case. It's important to be predictable because it ensures that we get education on the resolution and that the negative team can adequately answer their case and have a chance of winning the round. The bright line standard is uh, when negatives will argue that there should be clear meanings behind terms and that there should be a clear dividing line between topical and non-topical cases. The fairness standard is a standard you would read in conjunction with one or any combination of the standards mentioned on the slide. The argument is that because the affirmative is unpredictable, explodes limits, and or destroys ground, this makes it unfair because the affirmative team will always have a greater chance of winning the round. And then finally, the education standard is something you would read, again, in conjunction with one or any combination of the standards already mentioned. The argument is that because the affirmative is unpredictable, explodes limits, destroys ground, and or is unfair, the education we get in the round is lost. <clears throat> and I don't know why I didn't do this uh, on the body of the slide, but what I just read to you is almost word for word plagiarized from a website called thedebateguru.weebly.com slash topicality.html. Uh, if you want to go uh, read that further. Topicality arguments are some of the easiest arguments to answer in a debate round because there is a formula that you can use. Uh, one, uh, one option is to argue that the other side's interpretation or definition doesn't meet their own standards. Um, if the other side says you should use standard X and you can show that their definition or their interpretation doesn't meet their own standard, well, then they just not only do they lose the topicality argument, they, they look pretty silly. Um, a more common <laughs> I, I, I think that's pretty rare, but it's comical when it happens. A more common way to answer a topicality argument is the we meet strategy. Affirmative teams use the we meet uh, standard or answer to explain why they meet the original negative interpretation or definition. If the affirmative meets the interpretation, if they are, you know, how do I want to say this? If they meet the interpretation, then they have defeated the negative's topicality argument. A counter interpretation is a different way of interpreting the, re the topic or defining the word. Affirmatives in policy debate present a different definition of the word and explain how they meet it. Given that it is not possible to predict every topicality argument that the negative team will make, affirmatives should have a definition of each term in the resolution with them and an explanation as to how they meet it. Counter standards are standards that the affirmative introduces into the debate to argue that the judge should accept their definition or interpretation instead of, or at least in addition to, the negative's interpretation. Popular counter standards include the following. Reasonability. Since words have many meanings, negatives can always find definitions or interpretations that affirmatives don't meet. Instead of looking for the most limiting interpretation, the judge should accept any reasonable interpretation of the term. Reasonable interpretations still provide opportunities for solid negative arguments. Field context. 
Terms should be taken to mean what they are generally assumed to mean in the topic-specific literature. Affirmative teams will often find topic-specific meanings when researching their affirmative and advocate these in the debate. Affirmative predictability. Affirmative teams cannot fairly predict every odd definition of a term that the negative could read. Interpretations of the topic should be limited to common sense meanings. With a few tweaks, I think we can make topicality a stock issue for POR plus debates as follows. First, because POR plus debate topics are usually questions, not resolutions, both debaters have the opportunity to defend their answer to the question in their respective opening statements. For that reason, I think topicality can be applicable to both opening statements. If either opening statement is off topic, the opposing debater could run a topicality argument making that very point. Second, even if a debater's opening statement is mostly on topic, it is conceivable that a portion of the opening statement might be off topic. For example, imagine a debate on God's existence in which the atheist presented two arguments, the argument from evil and the argument from the Pacific Crest Trail. According to the latter argument, the Pacific Crest Trail is a better through-hiking trail than the Appalachian Trail. In reply, the theistic debater would argue that the Pacific Crest Trail argument is extra-topical because that argument isn't relevant to the topic. With these changes in mind, now let's now take a look at the elements of a topicality argument in a POR plus debate. The elements of a topicality argument in POR plus debates are almost identical to their counterparts in policy debates. The biggest change is in the voters element since POR plus debates typically don't have formal debate judges. And so instead of referring to the judge or judges, it now refers to the audience. From a practical consideration, I would say that running topicality and extra topicality arguments in a POR plus debate is risky. First, running topicality and extra topicality takes time. The more time a debater spends on topicality and extra topicality, the less time they have to devote to other issues in the debate. Second, extra topicality objections may backfire and cause the audience to think about the extra topical evidence anyway. Remember that POR plus debates are almost never judged by formal debate judges. So the voters element of a topicality argument is, in effect, analogous to a jury trial in which the judge instructs the jury to disregard certain items of evidence. Empirical evidence from the legal field suggests that such jury instructions often have the opposite effect. After judges tell juries to disregard certain items of evidence, juries often pay more attention to the evidence to be disregarded. It would not be at all surprising if the same thing happened with the audience in a POR plus debate. Examples of topicality or extra topicality arguments from well-known POR plus debates are easy to find. For example, in debates about God's existence, a non-trivial number of atheists will argue that a literal interpretation of the Bible is false or that creationism is false. In response, theistic debaters have argued that biblical inerrancy and God's method of creation are off topic. Similarly, on the theistic side, a non-trivial number of theists have argued against materialism uh, or uh, determinism uh, and arguing that materialism is false and or determinism is false. In response, atheist debaters have argued that materialism and determinism are off topic. Let's take a detailed look at some examples of each. Our first example is taken from the 1998 debate between William, Dr. William Lane Craig and Dr. Massimo Pigliucci. In his opening statement, Dr. Pigliucci argued that biblical inerrancy is false. Quote, also, Christianity makes some specific statements about the world and about humans. If you believe, for example, literally in the Bible, which I'm guessing Dr. Craig does not, if you really believe in the Bible, of course, you get in a bunch of problems. Science can answer that there wasn't such a thing as Noah's flood, and certainly not as a worldwide event. 
Other things are, well, the sun never stopped anywhere in the sky because the sun doesn't move at all. It's the earth that rotates around the sun and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of specific statements in the Bible that simply cannot be taken literally. But even if you don't take it literally and you get some kind of general meaning, well, generally speaking, man is supposed to have fallen from somewhere, from grace, supposedly. Well, evolutionary biologist tells us that, in fact, man evolved in a positive way and is one of the most complex creatures in the world today. It's the end product of a very long process of evolution. I really see those two things in direct contradiction, end quote. <clears throat> in the next speech, Dr. Craig's rebuttal, Dr. Craig raised a topicality objection. He said, the fifth argument he raised was the problem of Noah's Ark. I would simply just dismiss this by saying, first, it doesn't disprove the existence of God. Secondly, I would take Noah's flood to be a local flood, not a universal flood in any case. Two points to notice here. First, Dr. Craig's summary of Dr. Pigliucci's argument isn't accurate. In his own words, Dr. Pigliucci said, quote, if you believe, for example, literally in the Bible, you get in a bunch of problems, end quote. In support of that claim, Dr. Pigliucci mentioned Noah's flood, not Noah's ark, but that was just one of several examples given by Dr. Pigliucci. Dr. Pigliucci's argument was really an argument against biblical inerrancy. By describing it as merely the problem of Noah's Ark, Dr. Craig was misrepresenting what Dr. Pigliucci said. But leave that to the side. We're not here to assess the Craig-Pigliucci debate. We're here to use their interaction to illustrate a topicality objection. Second, notice Dr. Craig's first point. He says, quote, First, it doesn't disprove the existence of God, end quote. I think he's right about that. He could have said the same thing if he had correctly represented Pigliucci's argument. Craig doesn't spell it out the way I have described a topicality objection, but let's try to reconstruct what his implied objection would be. In fact, let's try to steel man his objection. If I may be so bold as to put words in Craig's mouth by steel manning his topicality objection, I think it would go like this. The fifth argument he raised was the alleged errancy of the Bible. The debate topic is, does God exist? That question asks us to consider whether there exists a personal creator and designer of the universe who is the locus of absolute value. The argument from biblical errancy isn't an argument for atheism. Even if the Bible is errant, that doesn't make God's existence impossible or even improbable. Our time in this debate is limited. Being forced to debate off-topic arguments like biblical inerrancy forces us to take time away from the many on-topic arguments we could be discussing instead. Therefore, I ask the audience to disregard this off-topic argument, end quote. You'll notice that the first sentence of my steel man includes a sentence that debaters call a signpost. Signposting isn't an element of topicality or extra topicality. Rather, it's a verbal cue for the audience to track the argument to which the debater is about to respond. Everything else in my steel man does map to an element of a topicality argument or topicality objection. I now want you to imagine yourself in Dr. Pigliucci's position. If you were in that debate with Dr. Craig, how might you have answered him? If I had been Dr. Pigliucci, here's what I would have said. My fifth argument was the argument from biblical errancy. I agree with Dr. Craig that in this debate, only arguments relating to the possibility or probability of God's existence are relevant. My argument from biblical errancy meets that interpretation for two reasons. First, Dr. Craig opened the door to arguments about Christianity when he argued for the resurrection. It is rather one-sided for him to imply that he's allowed to talk about Christian theism when he thinks it helps his case, but I can't talk about it when it helps mine. 
Second, my argument is what Christian philosopher Richard Swinburne calls a C-inductive argument. My argument is not that biblical errancy is logically inconsistent with Christian theism. Rather, my argument is that biblical errancy is more surprising on the assumption that Christian theism is true than on the assumption that atheism is true. If Christian theism were true, then God might or might not have ensured that the books of the Bible were written in such a way as to prevent errors. For example, the book of Genesis might not have made any scientific claims at all. Or, if God wanted Genesis to make scientific claims, then God could have ensured that the claims were accurate. In contrast, if atheism is true, we would expect that if any holy books existed, they would reflect the culture and beliefs of the time in which the holy books were written. That's exactly what we find with the Bible, and so that's my fifth argument for atheism. Therefore, I ask you to consider this argument when weighing the evidence. And, uh, and that's the end of my steel man. You'll notice that this steel man response again begins with a signpost, succinctly telling the audience the argument I am about to refute. My answer has two defenses, the fairness defense and the I meet defense. If you read books on policy debates, you'll find that they mention uh, defenses which we reviewed earlier, like we meet, counterinterpretation, and counter standards. I'm not aware of anyone using, um, I'll skip that. I'm not even going to get into that. Um, let's return to a second example of a theistic topicality objection, also from Dr. Craig. My next example is taken from the 2014 debate on God and cosmology, the existence of God in light of contemporary cosmology between Dr. Craig and Dr. Sean Carroll. Dr. Carroll said many things in support of atheism in his opening statement. Most of what he said was directly relevant to cosmology, but arguably one portion of his speech was not. Let's listen to Dr. Carroll. Fifth and most importantly, theism fails as an explanation. Even if you think the universe is finely tuned and you don't think that naturalism can solve it, theism certainly does not solve it. If you thought it did, if you played the game honestly, what you would say is, here is the universe that I expect to exist under theism. I will compare it to the data and see if it fits. What kind of universe would we expect? And I claim that over and over again, the universe we expect matches the predictions of naturalism, not theism. So the amount of tuning, if you thought that the physical parameters of our universe were tuned in order to allow life to exist, you would expect enough tuning, but not too much. Under naturalism, a physical mechanism could far over-tune by an incredibly large amount that has nothing to do with the existence of life, and that is exactly what we observe. For example, the entropy of the early universe is much, 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 much lower than it needs to be to allow for life. You would expect under theism that the particles and parameters of particle physics would be enough to allow life to exist and have some structure that was designed for some reason, whereas under naturalism, you'd expect them to be kind of random and a mess. Guess what? They are kind of random and a mess. You would expect under theism life to play a special role in the universe. Under naturalism, you'd expect life to be very insignificant. I hope I don't need to tell you, life is very insignificant as far as the universe is concerned. Here is a photograph from the Hubble Space Telescope of a few hundred out of the hundreds of billions of galaxies in our observable universe. The theistic explanation for cosmological fine tuning asks you to look at this picture and say, I know why it's like that. It's because I was going to be here, or we were going to be here. But there is nothing in our experience of the universe that justifies the kind of flattering story we like to tell about ourselves. In fact, I would argue that the failure of theism to explain the fine tuning of the universe is paradigmatic. It helps understand the other ways in which theism fails to be a better theory than naturalism. What you should be doing over and over again is comparing the predictions or expectations under theism to under naturalism. You find that over and over again, naturalism wins. And I'm going to zoom through these. It's not the individual arguments that are important. It's the accumulated effect. If theism were really true, there's no reason for God to be hard to find. He should be perfectly obvious, whereas in naturalism, you might expect people believe in God, but the evidence to be thin on the ground. Under theism, you'd expect that religious beliefs should be universal. There's no reason for God to give special messages to this or that primitive tribe thousands of years ago. Why not give it to anyone? Whereas under naturalism, you'd expect different religious beliefs inconsistent with the, with the other to grow up under different local conditions. 
Under theism, you'd expect religious doctrines to last a long time in a stable way. Under naturalism, you'd expect them to adapt to social conditions. Under theism, you'd expect the moral teachings of religion to be transcendent, progressive, sexism is wrong, slavery is wrong. Under naturalism, you'd expect that they reflect, once again, local mores, sometimes good rules, sometimes not so good. You'd expect the sacred texts under theism to give us interesting information. Tell us about the germ theory of disease. Tell us to wash our hands before we have dinner. Under naturalism, you'd expect that sacred text to be a mishmash, some really good parts, some poetic parts, and some boring parts and mythological parts. Under theism, you'd expect biological forms to be designed. Under naturalism, they would derive from the twists and turns of evolutionary history. Under theism, minds should be independent of bodies. Under naturalism, your personality should change if you're injured, tired, or you haven't had your cup of coffee yet. Under theism, you'd expect that maybe you can explain the problem of evil. God wants us to have free will. But there shouldn't be random suffering in the universe. Life should be essentially just. And at the end of the day, in theism, you basically expect the universe to be perfect. Under naturalism, it should be kind of a mess. This is very strong empirical evidence. In my opening speech, I argued that God's existence is significantly more probable given the evidence of contemporary cosmology than it would have been without it. And this is due to the support which cosmology lends to key premises in the cosmological and teleological arguments. Now, before we review those arguments, let me just say a word about Professor Carroll's uh, concluding remarks, which I believe are extraneous to tonight's discussion. He's very concerned to show that God's existence is improbable relative to certain non-cosmological data. For example, the problem of evil, our insignificant size, and so forth. The very fact that these are non-cosmological data shows that they are not relevant in tonight's debate. And I've addressed things like the problem of evil extensively, uh, for example, in Philosophical Foundations for a Christian Worldview. So the debate tonight is not over the probability of theism versus naturalism. Uh, that would assess us, uh, requires to assess all sorts of non-cosmological uh, data. Rather, the question is, is God's existence more probable given the data of cosmology, contemporary cosmology, than it would have been without it? And I think it certainly is. So again, if I may be so bold as to put words in Craig's mouth by steelmanning his topicality objection, I think it would go like this. Before we review those arguments, let me just say a word about Professor Carroll's concluding remarks, which I believe are extraneous to tonight's discussion. Dr. Carroll argued that God's existence is improbable relative to certain non-cosmological data, for example, the problem of evil, our insignificant size, and so forth. The very fact that these are non-cosmological data shows that they are not relevant in tonight's debate. The debate tonight is not over the probability of theism versus naturalism. Rather, the question is, is God's existence more probable given the data of contemporary cosmology than it would have been without it? Now, you might just say, what's the big deal? Why not just debate these other topics also? The answer is that if we expand the topic to debate theism versus naturalism, that decision would require us to assess all sorts of non-cosmological data at the expense of focusing on the cosmological data, which is the theme of this conference and why we are here. Because there are so many on-topic arguments specifically about God and cosmology, I ask you to disregard his concluding remarks and only consider evidence from cosmology. And that ends my steel man of Craig's response. <clears throat> Again, the purpose of this presentation is to introduce a framework for POR plus debates and to teach interested parties in how they might apply this framework. So as with the previous example, I'm going to ask you to pretend that you are the that you are in the debate as the atheist, Dr. Carroll, listening to Dr. Craig's first rebuttal. If you were Dr. Carroll, how might you respond to Dr. Craig's extra topicality objection? If I had been Dr. Carroll, here's what I would have said. 
I am going to go slightly out of order and respond first to Dr. Craig's objection to my fifth point, which was that theism fails as an explanation. I agree with Dr. Craig that this debate is about God and cosmology and that the arguments need to focus on the cosmological data. I believe that my fifth point meets that interpretation. I began my point by giving two examples of cosmological data which are better predicted by naturalism than by theism. They were one, the entropy of the early universe, and two, the role that life plays in the universe. I then argued that theism's failure as a cosmological explanation is paradigmatic of theism's failure as an explanatory hypothesis in general. Recall that in his opening speech, Dr. Craig began by making a comparative claim about theism and naturalism as explanations of the cosmological data. He said, quote, the probability of theism conditional upon contemporary cosmology and background information is much greater than the probability of theism conditional only on background information. I'm, ar end quote, I'm arguing that the failure of theism as an explanation for non-cosmological data is part of the relevant background information which needs to inform our comparative assessment of those probabilities. Therefore, I ask you to agree with Dr. Craig's point that we need to consider the background information and consider theism's failure to explain non-cosmological data when weighing the cosmological data. That ends my steel man uh, response to Dr. Craig on behalf of Dr. Carroll. Once again, you'll notice that my steel man answer again begins with a signpost, succinctly telling the audience which argument I am about to refute. Furthermore, it calls out the fact that I am going to respond to Dr. Craig's rebuttal out of order. I made responding to Craig's extra topicality objection the top priority for Dr. Carroll's first rebuttal speech. Why did I do that? In competitive formal policy debates with debate judges, topicality is a voting issue. If you lose on topicality, you can lose the round, and so policy debaters are trained to deal with topicality first. POR plus debates are not judged by formal debate judges, at least not usually. In this, uh, so why did I do it here? In this example, I made it the top priority because there is a risk that a topicality or extra topicality objection can damage the debater's credibility. If left unanswered, a member of the audience might think that Dr. Carroll was being unfair to Dr. Craig and or that Dr. Carroll couldn't defend naturalism's ability to explain the cosmological data. So instead, he had to introduce the extra topical topic of the non-cosmological data. Let's now turn to an example where the atheist debater could have raised or might have raised a topicality or extra topicality objection. I'd now like to offer an example of a topicality argument an atheist might make. The argument I am about to illustrate was not given by the atheist debater. To fully appreciate this example, you'll need to have some familiarity with Dr. Greg Bonson's entire opening statement in his famous debate with Gordon Stein. If you're not familiar with that, you can easily find it on YouTube. I also have a video series on my YouTube channel with my formal assessment of that debate. What I would like to do now is illustrate how an atheist debater might have run a topicality argument against Dr. Bonson in that debate. Before addressing my arguments, I'd like to begin with an objection to Dr. Bonson's entire opening statement. The debate topic is, does God exist? That question asks us to consider whether there exists a personal being who is a creator of the universe who is all-powerful, all-knowing, and morally perfect. Dr. Bonson's sole argument for theism tonight was his transcendental argument. It is perfectly fine to argue for theism by arguing for a specific version of theism if you actually do that. But that's not what just happened. Although he described it as an argument for Christian theism, what we just heard was an argument against crude materialism. 
I would simply just dismiss this argument by saying that isn't a relevant topic in tonight's debate for two reasons. First, even if materialism is false, that doesn't make it necessary that God exists. One doesn't have to deny the existence of all immaterial objects in order to deny the existence of an immaterial God. It may be the case that abstract objects exist, and so materialism is false, and that God doesn't exist. Second, even if materialism is false, Dr. Bonson is given no reason to think that the falsity of materialism would raise the probability of God's existence. Our time in this debate is limited. Being forced to debate off-topic issues like materialism, an issue which atheists themselves disagree about, forces us to take time away from the many on-topic arguments we could be discussing instead. There was one part of his speech that was relevant to our debate, but not in the way Dr. Bonson thinks. I will argue that the existence of abstract objects can be flipped into an argument for atheism. The argument goes like this. Premise 1. There exist abstract objects, objects which are distinct from God, but do not depend on God's creative activity for their existence. This is the premise supplied by Dr. Bonson when he said that the laws of logic are abstract entities. Premise 2. If God, as defined by classical theism, exists, then everything distinct from God depends on God's creative activity for its existing. Therefore, 3. God, as defined by classical theism, does not exist. So in addition to the seven lines of evidence I've given in favor of source physicalism, we've now got the evidence from abstract objects. Thank you, Dr. Bonson. That's the end of my, uh, of my topicality argument against Dr. Bonson. You'll notice that in this topicality objection, I've replaced the voter element with a flip element. I don't ask the audience to ignore Dr. Bonson's transcendental argument because I think many members of the audience would instead ignore my request. So instead, I use a tactic debaters call the flip, the turn, or turnaround. Dr. Bonson says that the laws of logic are abstract universal entities. The argument from abstract objects turns that statement in favor of atheism. Now, imagine you are Dr. Bonson in that debate with me. How might you respond to the topicality argument I just stated? If I were Dr. Bonson, I would respond to the topicality, ar uh, topicality argument as follows. I want to respond directly to Mr. Lauder's objections to the transcendental argument for the Christian worldview. I agree with Mr. Lauder that this debate is about whether God exists. Although I define generic or mere theism somewhat differently than he does, his definition is good enough because I'm not defending generic or mere theism anyway. As he correctly says, I'm defending Christian theism or the Christian worldview, and it's perfectly acceptable to defend theism by defending Christian theism. His topicality argument boils down to the claim that the transcendental argument isn't an argument for the Christian worldview. Rather, at best, it is an argument against materialism. In response, I have two replies. First, even if Mr. Lauder were correct that the transcendental argument did not prove the Christian worldview and instead only disproved materialism, it still wouldn't follow that the argument was off topic. Materialism, or materialist naturalism as he calls it, is a version of source physicalism, which means that materialism takes up some of the probability space for source physicalism. Thus, evidence against materialism is at least some evidence against source physicalism, even if it is only what Richard Swinburne calls a C-inductive argument. Therefore, even if you agree with Mr. Lauder that the transcendental argument fails to prove the Christian worldview, that doesn't deny the fact that the falsity of materialism is evidence against source physicalism and so raises the probability of theism. Therefore, I ask you to consider the transcendental argument as you weigh the cases for Christianity and source physicalism. Second, it is in fact false that the transcendental argument does not prove the Christian worldview. At first glance, this might seem counterintuitive. You might wonder, 
what metaphysical resources are available to the Christian, but not available to the Jew or to the Muslim to account for the laws of logic, the laws of science, or the laws of morality? I address this near the beginning of my opening statement. First, the various conceptions of deity found in the world's religions are, in most cases, logically incompatible, leaving no unambiguous sense to general theism, whatever that might be. Secondly, I have not found the non-Christian religions to be philosophically defensible, each of them being internally incoherent or undermining human reason and experience. Thus, contrary to Mr. Lauder, the transcendental argument is an argument for the Christian worldview, not just an argument against materialism. That ends my steel-manned response on behalf of Dr. Bonson to myself uh, uh, against the topicality argument that I just illustrated. For what it is worth, I agree with the first but not the second part of this response that I've put in Dr. Bonson's mouth. Evidence against materialism is evidence against source physicalism, just as evidence against ontological idealism, the view that only the mental exists, is evidence against source idealism. In conclusion, I'd like to offer the following points about topicality in POR plus debates. First, topicality, like pregnancy, is binary. An opening statement is either topical or it isn't. An individual argument is either topical or it isn't, what we would call extra topical. There is no middle ground. Second, anyone who is thinking about doing formal debates in POR plus should understand how to make a topicality argument or an extra topical objection in case their opponent goes off topic. But they should also know how to defend themselves in case their opponent accuses them of going off topic. Third, topicality arguments should be used sparingly, but that does not mean they should never be used. If your opponent is going off topic, then by all means, run a topicality argument or run an extra topicality objection. My advice though is to only do that when there is a blatant violation of the topic. Fourth, if you've been keeping score, you might have noticed that all three examples of topicality or extra topicality arguments slash objections uh, that I've reviewed in this presentation, in all three cases, the answer to those arguments slash objections were successful. That isn't a coincidence. Topicality arguments and extra topicality ar objections are hard to win, even with formal debate judgment. If you've enjoyed this review and you're not already a subscriber to my channel, go ahead and click the subscribe button. You'll get notified when I upload new videos. Also check me out on Twitter and on Blogger.